very much for that. And colleagues, good afternoon. Uh, and uh, I would like to tell you that I'm going to speak to you this afternoon, but in fact, as you will see, I'm not going to speak to you this afternoon. What I would like to do is I would actually like to take you on a journey, if I may. And the journey I would like, you, like to take you on is a little bit of a time slip. I would like to move us from 2021 to 2061. So hopefully you've now slipped with me to 2061. Now I would like to give you my presentation. As you know, the presentation is, uh, is in a conference that we have chosen to call 50 Years of Directing Materials Assembly. And uh, it is hosted in Cambridge, although of course we are all virtual as one would expect these days. And uh, I'm going to give you a 50 year retrospective on the theme of directed assembly of materials. As you will see from the logo in the top left hand corner, this presentation and indeed the conference, the celebration conference of 50 years of directed assembly is sponsored by the World Institute of Directed Assembly or WIDA, which I'm sure you've heard about, and many of you will have been sponsored by WIDA to attend this meeting. And in fact, some of you will have your work funded by WIDA as well. What I'm going to try to do today is give you a picture of how 50 years ago, the area of directed assembly was founded and initiated in the UK, and subsequently how it has developed more widely than the UK and become a worldwide phenomenon, and indeed, be highlighting towards the end of the presentation, uh, after covering the principles by which directed assembly has evolved, I will be covering at the end of this presentation some of the enormous achievements that directed assembly has had over the last 50 years, including some which you'll be aware of, which have only happened in the last three or four years in the late 2050s. One personal note on this, uh, it is particularly uh, pleasurable and in fact something of a surprise to me to be able to speak to you this afternoon because 2061 represents my 100th year and uh, when I was uh, when I was the age of most of the participants in this uh, in this conference uh, I would not have expected to be able to be mobile and presenting talks at the age of 100 but of course the advances in medical science and in other sciences over the past 30 or 40 years has made it possible for even somebody like me to remain active and, uh, and able to speak to you today. And at least one of those advances is related to the directed assembly programs. Just a comment about our lead organization, WIDA, the World Institute of Directed Assembly. Uh, and I won't try to summarize for you what WIDA is about. You can, of course, access lots of information about this organization, which is now, you know, more than 30 years old and you can look at its history and I'll very briefly talk about its establishment. But you can see here one of those word maps that have been popular since the, since the early 2000s, in fact, since, uh, since the 2010s. Uh, and it actually says quite a lot about the area of directed assembly and uh, the particular uh, angle that WIDA has taken upon that. So we see prominent words there about materials and molecules. We see application areas uh, such as manufacturing and we see processes there. We see the properties which underpin, of course, the whole of, uh, the, whole of the idea of directed assembly. And we also see important words like control and understanding and, of course, assembly. And that control and understanding is absolutely critical to the genesis of the area of directed assembly and some of the precursor work that was done in the 10 or 15 years before WIDA was formed. And I'm going to give you a little account of that today. Let's start with the early beginnings. And as I said, the early beginnings of, of directed assembly, which led to WIDA, actually were in, the, were, were in the UK. And it was by a network called Directed Assembly, which was funded by the then uh, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK. It was called, it was called EPSRC. And uh, it was enlightened enough to fund a network with the vision of delivering the controlled assembly of extended materials and, and we must applaud the very early pioneers who were able to, to, to prepare that vision and to uh, obtain the initial pump priming funding to allow it to happen. 
And those early pioneers were Professor Paul Rafe, who was then at the University of Bath, and Professor Harris Makatsouris. Uh, it was an academic-led group, grouping led by Paul and Harris, and uh, it, it obtained very substantial industrial and commercial partnership. And that was key. It was key to giving the credibility to the directed assembly area while also allowing it to pursue the fundamental investigations that were so critical to develop the underpinning science to, to, to allow the, the, the vision to be developed. And of course, our industrial and commercial partners in, uh, in directed assembly, uh, I say our because I had the pleasure of working with Paul and Harris in the early days of trying to establish this all those years ago, 50 years ago or so. Uh, we, we, we worked very closely with our industrial and commercial partners in developing the vision, in addition to it giving us the sort of aim and the, and the motivation to develop the fundamentals. The important thing about this area, and it was one of the, one of the early uh, attempts and successful attempts to do this. It brought together research across many domains, many disciplines, to look at how we put extended materials together with a focus on ultimately delivering their properties. And we'll see some examples of that later. And here are some early pictures from the time of, uh, of, of the, the way in which advanced materials were being developed. Uh, with some, you know, for, for, for the time, for 50 years ago, pretty pictures, of course, they've evolved, uh, they've evolved enormously since then. Oh, I should have said, actually, one of my, one of the things that I've tried to emphasize in this presentation, I should have said this right at the start, is I am using 2010, 2020 technology rather than using 2060 technology. So please bear, bear with me. I think you've been primed that that is likely to have been the format of this. So I, I am not a hologram. I'm a flat a flat image on your screen and the presentation I'm giving is in, is in a piece of software actually long obsolete. It's called PowerPoint and everybody in those days back in 2010s and in fact the 2000s in general used this, used this piece of software, believe it or not. I know it, it, it blows your mind that we were using things as primitive as this, but this is the way we were presenting. So I'm trying to give you that immersion in looking at and delivering this retrospective. So I hope you find that of historic interest as well as perhaps finding the material of some interest. And this, this picture on the bottom left here, which is of, you know, of, of one of these sort of interpenetrating networks of you know, molecular networks, actually was an important component of the very early logo for the directed assembly network. And some of you may recognize, may recognize that. Initially, the, uh, the aims of the directed assembly, although underpinned by, by chemistry, by engineering, by biologists and by other, uh, by other uh, and computational scientists and others, it was driven uh, by the materials that we thought we were going to be able to control, which is extended materials, including inorganic materials, but also importantly by supramolecular chemistry, which at the time was a sort of burgeoning, you know, a burgeoning relatively early stage, but, but maturing area of chemistry. And just to, just to you know, leap ahead a little bit from those early beginnings in 2010, 2011, the ideas were taken up internationally, as you may or may not know, in around the mid 2020s, when, uh, when colleagues in the US through the National Science Foundation, colleagues in Europe through sponsored programs within the European, uh, European Research Council, et cetera, really began to learn from what the directed assembly effort in the UK had done and begin to develop their, uh, their, their complementary programs, which then, as we will see, it uh, came together rather rather nicely. I would like though, just, just before we go on to that, just to share a little bit of the early vision from the pioneers, from Wraithby, from Makatsouris, and from the others involved in those, uh, in, in, in those early days. And uh, it, it really, I mean, these, this is too wordy. And again, this, this shows you the sort of primitive nature of the way in which we were presenting data in those days. Uh, but the idea was to control the assembly of matter uh, sufficiently accurately, uh, to be able to create materials and molecular assemblies, so these extended uh, systems, which had much more sophisticated and tunable properties and functions that, than were accessible at the time. So, so that, was, that was actually, you know, that's a vision which actually encompassed the whole area of what we would like to do in materials development. But these colleagues were brave enough to, to, uh, to, to make that statement. And then uh, they, they, they were visionary enough to actually establish a mechanism by which we could start to start to try to deliver that. So here is here's just a little bit of funny, a little bit of fun here. And basically the idea was that with any starting point, be it a material building block, be it a molecular building block, some assembly is always going to be required. And 
uh, I, I, I don't think that, uh, that the pioneers will mind me saying that this was a, an exceptionally simple uh, uh, graphic which they, 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 they devised. But although simple, it does actually get the message across, I think, extremely effectively. We are looking in the idea of assembly, as you will know, because you're working in this area, for new materials where we've, target, we've got targeted properties we can deliver. And the idea is that uh, we've got this virtuous loop of designing, engineering, and controlling, and then those three feed off each other in order to, to, to design Im improved materials, be able to engineer and be able to exert control both on the properties and indeed on the process by which they are being designed. So a nice virtual vir virtual cycle. And I think the pioneers, and, and actually I have to say that back in the, in, in the 2000s, I was a little bit culpable in this myself, were also inspired by some, some science fiction. And uh, at the time, there was a science fiction franchise which was 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 actually still very active in the in in the two thousands, but which had kicked off in the nineteen sixties, uh, and then produced some movies in the sort of nineteen eighties and the nineteen nineties. It was called Star Trek. You won't have heard of that. It was called Star Trek, but there was a really nice episode in in Star Trek and one of its movies, uh, which captured the idea of being able to do directed assembly. And the backstory to this is that uh, the uh, the 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 space the 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 space knots on 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 Star Trek on the Starship Enterprise as it was called uh, for 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 various reasons to do with saving the world and saving the universe had to go back to the 20th century from the 23rd century in order to extract two humpback whales from the ocean. Don't ask. They had to extract two humpback whales from the ocean, and in order to do that, they had to to accommodate those whales within their spaceship. It wasn't actually the Enterprise that went back. It was actually, we do, you want to know this, it was a Klingon spaceship, it doesn't matter. Uh, they, had to encapture, they had to capture these whales and transport them back to the 23rd century, which meant they needed a really strong, thin, light material. And this is what this they is tried to do. This is a fine place you have here, Dr. Nichols. Thank you. And I must say, Professor, your knowledge of engineering is most impressive. Yes, back home we call him the miracle worker. Indeed. <laughs> uh, may I offer you something, gentlemen? Dr. Nichols, I might be able to offer something to you. Yes? I notice you're still working with polymers. Still? What, what else would I be working with? Aye, what else indeed? I'll put it another way. How thick would a piece of your plexiglass need to be at 60 feet by 10 feet? Just to comment, in case you've not realized, these are the two futuristic 23rd century uh, colleagues. The other chap is from the 20th century. Feet ...to withstand the pressure of 18,000 cubic feet of water. To hold the whales. Oh, that's easy. Six inches. We carry stuff that big in stock. I uh, noticed. Now suppose, just suppose, I were to show you a way to manufacture a wall that would do the same job, but be only one inch thick. <laughs> and that be worth something to you, eh? <laughs> You're joking. Perhaps a professor could use your computer. Please. Computer? Computer? Just to clarify, you know that you can speak to your computer Back in the 20th century, we could not speak to our computers. We had to type on a keyboard, which he's about to do. Ah. Hello, computer. Just use the keyboard. The keyboard. How quaint. Transparent aluminum? That's the ticket, laddie. That shocked expression, that expression of, wow, what an insight, what a material, is what we were trying to capture in the early days of directed assembly. And you will have noticed that Engineer Scott 
who was the chap doing the typing, uh, was was clearly using some advanced 23rd century computational methodology that he had somehow brought back with him in order to design that new material, at least 23rd century knowledge. So how does one capture that? It sounds simple. All we want to do is, is design a material with a chosen property. And, and, and actually, you know, with some of the technologies that you're now aware we have available in 2061, it, it, it might appear simple to you, but back then it was by no means simple. And I'll just illustrate that with something extraordinarily simple, which at the time we were unable to control properly. This was actually an area of science I was working in myself at the time. Uh, we know that we might be able to change the packing of a molecule inside a solid state structure. So you might want to change the packing of a molecule from that shape on the left-hand side uh, to this shape on the right-hand side. And there are various reasons why we might want to do that. This happens to be a picture of a simple pharmaceutical molecule. The picture on the left shows a molecular network which is three-dimensional, which is fairly strongly interlinked by things called hydrogen bonds. The image on the right shows something of the, shows the same molecule, but now it has actually got a layered type structure with strong interactions in the plane, but weak interactions between the planes. It so happens, as you might expect, that the solid material formed from the packing on the right actually is, is softer. It's more compressible, which would be great for pharmaceutical processing. Also, again, for obvious reasons to do with the layering, is more soluble. So that would, in principle, be a more effective pharmaceutical be to be to be delivered. Uh, and, and that looks so easy, doesn't it? Well, actually, we didn't know how to design that. You know, we wanted to use molecular assembly into the solid state to produce our layered material ab initio without trial and error, without having to explore different crystallization conditions and things like that. And in the early 21st century, we still could not do that type of thing by design and on demand. And it was that sort of frustration and that potential that, that we had not yet explored that, uh, that that directed assembly was designed to try to tackle. And of course, things much more complex than that also. So the paradigm for controlling assembly was actually, you know, building on, on, on things that during the sort of 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s had been partially achieved for inorganic type, inorganic chemistry type networks. A lot of those inorganic type networks very powerful families of solid state materials were developed from very simple building blocks like the perovskite, uh, the perovskite oxide uh, building block. And it was difficult to extend that to, or, to up to more flexible materials such as molecules to be able to use those molecules and control their interactions in the same way as we could the inorganic things. So that was one of the paradigms that were, that were adopted in those days. And that's just one analogy. There are other, other analogies that one can learn from and benefit from. And I'll talk about the learning that Directed Assembly did in its early days in, 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 in a few slides time. Uh, but you could imagine DNA and the way in which it forms a, 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 you know, a, an architecture that the helical structures controlled and indeed uh, very much selected by things like the base pairing across DNA. And there were really nice examples of materials developments which, which grew out of that. Copolymers is an obvious one where you're sort of building in functionality and potentially tuning functionality of materials. There were natural framework materials followed by synthetic framework materials. There were biomembrane mimic, mimic, particularly synthetic biomembrane mimics, which were able to, 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 to reproduce a lot of the properties of, uh, of, you know, of, 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 of biological systems, of, you know, of, of model skins and things like that, uh, to look at transport, et cetera. So it wasn't the only model that there was, but none, in none of this was there a predictive core which was completely reliable. But the unifying factor in all of those was to try to exert this design and control delivering function and we knew how to get function but a lot of it was to do with uh, you know chemistry or, or or biochemical or biophysical cookery hugely successful hugely uh, uh, impressive stuff but we needed the idea to exert more design and control for that and here's just some examples of, of some of the types of system that i that i referred to this this on the left is a high temperature superconductor uh, based on sort of perovskite and 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 uh, and, and and copper oxide planes in the middle here, there's a there's a, actually a naturally occurring, occurring zeolite, which has been used to capture uh, uh, unwanted atmospheric gases, in this case, nitric oxide. And on the right hand side here, we've got a metal organic framework, a classic supramolecular uh, type framework, which was which was being explored in the, in the early 21st century. 
And just to say this type of work led to a series of Nobel Prizes, Nobel Prize in 1987, based, on, based around the, the high temperature superconductors, these perovskite based developments, Nobel Prize in 2016, based around the ideas of molecular machines and being able to control control those with molecular level and trying to build them into more extended structures. And then uh, you, you may well also be aware of, of, of developments in this area, which led to Nobel Prizes, uh, actually on a roughly 15 or 16 year cycle uh, in 2031 and in 2047. And of course, by that basis, this being 2061, watch, it, watch this space, I would confidently predict another Nobel Prize in this area uh, in about 2062 or 2063. So it must be coming up soon. So that will be exciting for us. I, I alluded to early on, in order to try to achieve that vision, the early pioneers really were acutely aware of the need for cross-disciplinarity. And actually, I know that this, this, this wider sponsored seminar is also benefiting from, you know, from, 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 from a lot of interest and a lot of attendance from colleagues who, who, have, who have come up through a different sort of disciplinary route, who are interested in, 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 in the sort of, you know, the, 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 the successor technologies to things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, which were being developed in, the, in, in, in and around the time when directed assembly was beginning to deliver. And that sort of cross-disciplinarity was, was, was a vital component of, of what the UK uh, Directed Assembly Grand Challenge Network was trying to do. I, I mentioned earlier, it was rooted in chemistry and chemical engineering, partly because of the materials uh, and some of the basic approaches that we knew we needed to adopt in, uh, in, in developing the, the, the area. And indeed it produced things like roadmaps towards this sort of innovation. But in importantly, Directed Assembly has always, throughout its 50 years, linked strongly to biology, to engineering, to manufacturing, to physics, to information technologies, as, I, as, I've, tried to, as I've tried to allude. So, so chemistry and materials are at the centre. The other sort of harder disciplines are, are, are depicted around here, but actually embedded in all of this and not actually separated out and deliberately not separated out is the idea of the computational underpinning that actually it's not separated out because it drives chemistry, it drives discovery in medicine, it drives biology and biochemistry, it drives understanding and discovery in physics, it drives our understanding of environmental science. So it deliberately not put in there, but, but ideas like artificial intelligence, machine learning in the 2010s, the 2020s were absolutely key to delivery of the initial vision and of course still still are as we as we move towards implementation so the key elements were really to design and engineer assembled uh, extending materials so so we need to be able to engineer the material and to engineer material built up from these molecular or or, 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 or inorganic building blocks we focus largely on molecular and some of the early work was to exert control over multiple length scales. And again, in 2061, you might think, well, we've, we've actually achieved that. Well, back in the 2010s, the 2020s, this was not yet, not yet fully achieved. So the idea was being able to be able to engineer the molecular scale and then all the way up through meso, micro and macro scale, and then be able to scale up these extended materials to manufacturing and market scales in order to make them useful. We'll see some examples of that in a little while. A quick acknowledgement of some of the fundamentals. I don't talk about fundamentals in this uh, in this retrospective lecture. Uh, you don't want, you're not here to talk about to, to learn about fundamentals. You're all experts in the fundamentals. In any case, you're here just to hear a little bit about the history and a little bit about the achievements. But of course, uh, the, the early pioneers were strongly motivated by by the understanding. And the understanding that they needed to, to exert in order to engineer these more extended materials was an understanding of both the strong and the weak forces that were involved in materials assembly. So a lot of fundamental work had to be done to underpin the, uh, the predictive and then the practical development of materials. And so that would lead to the ability to design a condensed phase, phase material with a desired function. And that meant that one wanted to come from two directions. One wanted to understand structure property relationships, the absolute core underpinning in this area, in molecules, materials, and in multiple component assemblies as we try to build up more sophisticated materials types with more sophisticated and, com and combined sets of properties. And as you know from, uh, fr from your own work in this and from your exposure to it and, and from the developments that there have been you know, over the last 30 or 40 years, this is only made possible by developments and computational capabilities. And notably, actually, just to refer back to the idea of structure property relationships, notably the ideas of machine learning, being able to harness 
as I put it in a very simple minded way, harness the empirical, make the observations. What have we observed both explicitly and implicitly in materials development, in trying to deliver materials properties? And then, of course, the, 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 the simpler and then the more advanced techniques of machine learning enable us to extract from that the key, the key elements the key components, the key learnings that perhaps a scientist working on her or his own, looking at things, however clever they are, might not pick out, but the vast data crunching, the vast, uh, the vast capabilities of machine learning is able to extract that information and point the scientist in a way that she can then, she can then develop her materials in the most effective way. And of course, I will come on to point out the fact that we then were able to get sufficiently sophisticated that uh, in appropriate cases, we were able to take the scientist out of the loop, having learned enough to do that and actually have these autonomous systems, which were effectively de delivering on that as well. But I'm leaping ahead of myself, which is a habit that I have even at my age, uh, as, as I approach 100 years, I still try to leap ahead and, and, go, and, and go, off, go off message a little bit. So the idea of the directed materials assembler was, was, was sort of you're know, driving the pioneers back in back in 2010, 2011, when, when directed assembly was first founded. Uh, and of course, as we know now, the rational design of functional molecules and extended materials in the computer is an absolute reality. It's absolutely routine in 2061 and is now being applied. Predictions of the solid state properties are reliable. The function is built from basic building blocks whose properties we can understand fully. And we also understand how they assemble and how that change of length scale affects the properties as well. Uh, trust me, all this seems easy to you. Back in the day, it was not at all easy to see how that would work. And of course, as I alluded in the previous uh, in the previous slide, this is now fully integrated with computer directed, you know, autonomous or semi autonomous assembly, which as we'll see later becomes increasingly important depending on where the assembly is taking place. And of course, you, th th this is actually probably more harking back to some of the fundamentals that the pioneers were that, that w w w were aware needed to be harnessed. The idea of characterization and property measurements online and inline was very important early on to provide the core data, which gave the data sets which the machine learning was able to was able to uh, was able to crunch to get out the, the important the important factors. And I did say that I would talk a little bit about about the World Institute of Directed Assembly, WIDA, and it was founded as you as you may know if you know your history of this in 2027. Uh, with uh, the UK having been a pioneer and then Europe, USA and then Asia, picking up on this idea and opening up to the fact that, 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 that more would be better in this. And uh, WIDA was formed around evolving materials assembly challenges, looking at those genuinely global efforts, some of which I'll allude to uh, in a few slides time, that really needed sort of worldwide collaboration. And I, th I, think I've, I've just got a, I think I've just got an inside joke here. Uh, that the, the, those of us on the inside of WIDA have always liked to use because we, under, we, we, we have always had a deep motivation to understand the fundamentals and delve deeply down into what the materials are doing and how they're behaving. We also call WIDA WIDA and deeper because we've always sought a deeper understanding. Uh, puns were uh, a bad thing in 2010 and 2020, and they remain a bad thing in 2061. So I apologize for that. Uh, just to say that you, you'll be aware of some of the some of the developments. I'm not going to talk about the nano assemblers. You're well established uh, and, 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 and absolutely routine in, in delivering a whole heap of, uh, of, 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 of sort of materials uh, with all sorts of functionalities. I'm not going to talk about these. I'm going to talk more about the materials side of things. Uh, so here's a, just a, an early picture of what a nano assembler would look like. And uh, you, as you know, the nano assemblers, which is not really what we are looking at, we are looking at more extended systems. These were these are materials whose function was controlled on very small length scales. And uh, this was a sort of parallel, parallel development. Dealing with the nano is distinctly different from dealing with the sort of meso and macro scale that we, are, we, were, we were talking about in directed assembly. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, it was really an, an example of scaling in materials manufacture, but scaling you know, in, in the, at, at, at short length scales and then scaling up the capabilities from that. And uh, just to say that the continuity across scales and the parallels that one could get between the nano assembler and, and directed assembly of more extended systems was, was actually really critical in helping to counter the, the suspicions that there were, believe it or not, uh, 40, 40 or more years ago, uh, 
about the ideas of nano goo and these nano materials being somehow somehow you know uh, uh, people being suspicious of them somehow them being sinister etc and and when we were able to convert that into regarding nano materials as just little materials materials on different end scales all that suspicion went went off and we were able to fully exploit that but that's off the topic i don't want to talk about nano materials instead i want to come back to directed assembly i'm now going to spend the next 10 minutes or so uh, talking about uh, the way in which uh, directed assembly, the network originally, the whole concept and the application has been more than the sum of its parts. And then in the last five or 10 minutes or so, I will move on to talk about some applications to which directed assembly has been put, some very prominent applications of which you'll be aware. So to start with uh, what, the, what, what our uh, US colleagues might call some simple math, and those of us in the UK would call some simple mathematics or simple maths. And it's, it's, this is a sort of equation that I like because it's not really an equation at all. And, and being so poor at mathematics myself, this is the sort of equation I love. So the vision of directed assembly was uh, something which was more than the sum of its parts because we were summing across input from a whole range of different disciplines. So I'm not even sure if that, uh, that, uh, uh, that sketchy word uh, picture of mathematics is accurate or not, but I like it and I'm going to continue to use it. So the idea was that some, you know, the direct assembly was more than the sum of its parts and it needed to be summed over many disciplines. Uh, and so now that directed assembly is a reality in 2061, we had to get more than the sum of the parts. And so we have already instilled, in fact, it's a long time ago, since 30 or 40 years ago, we've instilled new ways of thinking about materials. And uh, some of the the disciplinary sum that I talk about in that very simple uh, cartoon equation at the top is it can be cap encapsulated in just three examples that I'm going to show you over the next couple of slides. I'm going to show you how chemistry has been learning from biology and how we can harness that in rational design and materials, how biology has learned from engineering and how we can, ration how we can harness that in the rational design and materials, and how modeling has learned from from intelligence in, in this sort of computational sense, from artificial intelligence, from machine learning and from other areas. And again, how that is able to, to be implemented in some of our uh, work on rational design of materials. And of course, all of that has led to the new breed of materials assembly scientists and technologists, which have been developed and are delivering some of the benefits I'm going to show you in a few slides time. So let's go through those three simple learnings. I'm not going through these in detail. I'm certainly not an expert in anything other than a small part of chemistry and a tiny little bit of physics. So I'm not even going to pretend that I am. But just to give you a sort of couple of cartoons talking about where, where these things can learn from each other. And here's a picture of actually a fairly, you know, a, a nice cartoon actually of some biological processes going on. We don't need to understand anything about, about biology uh, to sort of uh, wonder you know, what these sort of what these ribbons are telling us on the right hand side and what these sort of you know, intertwined strands are on the left-hand side. And of course, we know that those ribbons are representative of, uh, of, of, of twists within protein molecules, large macromolecules. We know that those twisted, uh, twisted sort of intertwined uh, uh, strings on the left-hand side are, are double helical DNA, for example. And so embedded in all of this are actually the molecular functionalities. But in biology, they have been taken to another scale completely. And, and the reason they can be taken to another scale is because biology has had about 4 billion years to get it right. Whereas chemistry has had you know, a few hundred years to try to get it right. And of course, it's nowhere near as sophisticated in the way that the control being, can be exerted. But the control and the selectivity in biology is quite extraordinary. And it's quite extraordinary sometimes the redundancy that's built into a biological system. The sheer complexity of a protein molecule that might exist as an enzyme just to make or break a single chemical bond. It just blows the mind. And I hope you've, you, you, you've been exposed to that perhaps in your careers so far. And, and it's just always worth reflecting upon that. But basically biology had four billion years to try and get things right. And it's done a pretty pretty impressive job of it. I think we will all, we will all agree. But in terms of materials assembly trying to learn from biology, there's coding for that selectivity. I talked about the fact that these big molecules are often very, very selective in what they're trying to do. And a lot of that is to do with the, the sequencing in proteins or the sequencing in DNA, which just code for a particular selectivity. Seems like a lot of redundancy, but my goodness, it's effective and my goodness, it works, you know, 
99.99 whatever percent of the time. Huge, huge reproducibility. And there is that focus on specific function and high reliability, of course. And one thing I didn't mention, there's not really any sparks in this uh, diagram, but lots of sparks could be drawn in this diagram because what biology has got is a full, full integration of energy generation and recovery within biological systems, which makes them again amongst the most efficient things you could ever wish to, you could ever wish to encounter. Very difficult to design from scratch, but embedded in functional biological systems. So you can see there are lots of lessons that uh, materials assembly might learn from in, in biology. And you, you might you, you will know more about this than I do, probably a lot of you, and you might reflect on what those are. But biology can also learn, and biology has learned over, over years from, uh, from engineering. And there's a very simple picture there about how simple biological materials can be engineered to make something which is which, which, which is functional and functional perhaps in a different and sometimes even improved way over a natural biological material. So if one can harness materials assembly in biomedicine, what we do is we, we, we utilize adaptable and reconfigurable systems, learning from biology, but, but applying the evolution of these on much shorter timescales than biology does, you know, when they follow a natural course. So that reconfigurability and adaptability can be accelerated within the, the, the sort of chemical and engineering uh, senses. And for example, this has evolved to develop new Bio, fully biocompatible hybrid lightweight materials as replacements. And I don't want to tell you how many of those lightweight replacements I've got in here, which enables me to move around as if I was not 100 years old. So benefited from that. And of course, a lot of that was around the principles of additive manufacturing, which is materials assembly, just like we're talking about. Uh, and the early days, it was a simple printing type process and of course now additive manufacturing is absolutely inbuilt into our materials assembler as, 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 as you will know. But all of this really allowed uh, biological type materials to be created and evolved much more quickly than biology would naturally do it. Uh, artificial adaptive membrane systems of course harnessing the power of chemistry and of course a lot of this underpinned again point at me huge advantage the ideas of regener regenerative medicine both mechanical and also in terms of regenerating some of the tough, soft tissue and organs uh, that, we, that we have inside our body to try and make those last last longer and, and make people like me hopefully still able to function vaguely sensibly even at 100 years old. The third learning I want to talk about is sort of modeling from that computational intelligence that we're talking about and, and, and of course a lot of you are experts on that in this area. Again this is somewhere where as a as a materials directed assembly uh, expert in the in the early days I was just blown away by what we might what might be capable of and waited for the computational scientists to deliver the solutions for us, which was great. And uh, there's just a picture from the early days of what we imagined this flexible, you know, easy interactive assembly might, uh, might, might be driven from. Uh, and of course, I already mentioned the ideas of, of machine learning based on mining the correct data and, and, and looking at those generating the right size of data sets with the right type of information and so that we can learn from patterns and discover new patterns. Uh, and then use that as the basis, not only for materials design, but also to start developing art artificial intelligence approaches to build some of that knowledge and some of that autonomy in learning from what the scientists were doing with the machine learned, the machine processed, the, the critical pattern data, and then having the computer in turn again, be able to try to adapt in the same sort of way. And so there's a, break, a breakthrough moment in about 2027 or 2028, when there was a full harnessing of this type of human computer interaction capability to produce these creative autonomous systems to optimize directed assembly processes. Now, 27, 2028, that was really when the whole area started to take off. That was where it became almost a sort of industrial, industrial scale possibility. We were then able to create systems which were able to self-evolve in terms of materials assembly. And that was a step change in what we were doing. Uh, and just to say then at that point, once you're getting semi-autonomous or autonomous, the design and decision is automated within materials assembly and processing, which makes things much more efficient, it makes things much more rapid, uh, and it also makes things possible to implement in environments other than a controlled, uh, a total laboratory or factory type environment on earth. So just to just to sort of conclude with a, with 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 three or four slides on 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 ways in which I think the vision for directed assembly has been delivered, as we sit here in 2061, and uh, really when yes it has 
I, I preempt that. I wouldn't ask the question probably in a, in a lecture like this if I didn't think the answer was yes. So there are successes in key application areas and there's benefits there in science and technology to economics and to human well-being. But what's not to like, right? So, so yes, we have, we have delivered the, 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 the vision in many ways. And, and there's a sort of trivial example, which was an early success in this area, uh, which was based around the, uh, the color changing car, uh, which uh, the color changing car, which I'll show a little slide on in just a little bit. And that's relatively trivial, but actually, you know, it, it really caught the imagination uh, when, it, when, when it became a reality. Uh, I'll show you a little bit about the first stage of what is likely, hopefully over the next uh, decades, to become the space elevator to revolutionise near-Earth space travel and transport. Uh, the fully personalised home-based medicine assembler, uh, which actually benefited from one of the one of the great disruptors of the early 2020s, and I'll, I'll talk about that just, just very briefly. Uh, and then I'll, I'll conclude by talking about the construction and manning of the Mars base, which you'll be acutely aware of because it has been in the news over the last few years very, very prominently. So let's just talk about the colour changing car. And this is really uh, around benefits from being able to assemble switchable materials car is a fairly onto dull, surfaces light blue, to make advanced and it's not very exciting. And just occasionally I go out to my car in the morning and I think, well, actually, it's such a sunny day. I would really like that car to be a different colour today. So wouldn't it be fantastic if I came out on a sunny summer's morning to my car, which is coated with some wonderful optically responsive paint, where I can take out my car keys with a little remote control attached, select a button on my remote control, send a signal to the coating on the car, which makes it change colour to, say, a bright yellow for a sunny day. And by simple electronics, you would uh, be able to switch the colour of the, your car at will. So on a Monday, you might want a blue car. On a Tuesday, you might want a red car. Just a comment about that, folks. That was from one of the early projects that were carried out in this in this area back in the in the, in the 2010s, where the idea was to assemble uh, molecular materials which would have those color changing properties. You could see who the bad actor was. That was that was your interlocutor. That was myself. And the second person on that video was Paul Raithby, one of the pioneers of the directed assembly network, and of course the brains behind the whole operation to develop these materials. So, so, so that worked, that, that idea of developing those materials, these, these were early, early findings, but then it was, it was evolved very, very substantially. And the idea of the colour changing car was, was then introduced in about 2028 by the major motor manufacturers. And it, and it, added, it added some legislative issues, but it added a huge cosmetic uh, advantage. It actually contributed to sustainability uh, because people then, if they wanted to change their car colour, uh, just flicked a switch. And they were more satisfied with their uh, with their automobile for longer, and so we were able to make that more efficient. A more exotic application will be the, the, will be hopefully the delivery of the space elevator over the next uh, next couple of decades. Uh, but in fact, you know, the, you know the vision of the space elevator. The idea is to have these these towers which are which are anchored on Earth and anchored in near Earth orbit, uh, which provide a, a means by which there's uh, economical transport into near Earth orbit, which makes the whole idea of, 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 of space transport much more effective, much more efficient. It also actually potentially opens up the idea of genuinely uh, uh, constructing our near Earth uh, low orbit solar, ca solar catchers, because until we get the space elevator, it's not going to be efficient and effective to build those. It may well become a reality, and that would solve all of our energy issues in the, in, in the world, of course. But towards the space elevator, you can imagine we need to build something incredibly tall and incredibly thin, which is incredibly strong. Uh, and so the challenge for directed assembly here is to develop ultra light, ultra strong hybrid materials. Uh, and in fact, it then has to be implemented in a quasi one dimensional disposition. So that, that reduction of dimensionality creates its own challenges actually in, in, inside materials. And remember the space cable has got to be at least 100 kilometers high in order to start being effective. Uh, and indeed, advances have been made. And you can see here a very familiar type of, uh, type of architecture. Now that architecture of course is on the microscopic scale, but we do know that they are based around the sort of carbon 
carbon inspired nanotube networks that the way in which materials are assembled into this prototype space elevator back about 20 years ago uh, benefited a lot from early learning in that sort of area. And there's still a long way to go on this. But nonetheless, the prototype, which went up a few kilometers and was extremely, was extremely effective and, 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 and we were able to explore the, uh, the sort of the, 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 the ability to, to get narrow and explore the strengths and explore some preliminary transport up on these cables was actually very effectively done and work is ongoing to try to evolve that prototype. And just to say that the vision of course is low energy transfer, transfer of payloads to the low earth orbit and then that's going to revolutionize as I said the possibilities of energy generation by eventually constructing uh, solar, ca solar catchers close to earth and in our control and also give us access to space in a more effective and more efficient way and all the resources that we may be able to access there. Back to Earth for the next example. And uh, this is the example that I talked about actually benefited from one of the great perturbations uh, that we had in the early, early 2020s in the, in, in the world. And that's the idea of personalized uh, diagnostic and medicines being part of this whole assembler idea. And this is not just a directed assembly thing. This is actually an example where the directed assembly concepts had to couple with a couple of other equivalent networks looking at different aspects of materials development in order to be able to deliver effectively the outcome. The outcome, of course, is personalized medicines, right? And to make those personalized medicines very accessible and very tunable to particular applications. Uh, so we want the pill or whatever else it is to be just for us and just for that moment and absolutely on that personalized level. So make it fully personalized, ideally making the assembly home-based uh, under, under appropriate conditions. And so the directed assembly challenge was related to uh, not just to itself, the assembly of, of materials with properties, but also to the idea of sensing so that we diagnose what we need in terms of a, of a therapy. And also uh, we have to get the right molecules in order to assemble them into the most effective delivery vehicle. And so we needed to couple up with chemical synthesis developments as well. And so that was being able to bring three networks together. There was sense a need, there was dial a molecule, and there was directed assembly or dial a material, if you like. So those three networks covering diagnostic synthesis and assembly all had to come together in order to deliver this, deliver this vision. And, and, and that was going along absolutely fine. And then in the early 2020s, you may or may not remember, uh, because we fortunately managed to avoid the, the, the recurrence of too many of these events. We had, a, we had a pandemic in the early 2020s, which was a global, a global pandemic. It was called COVID-19, and it shut down large parts of, of the economy and, la and, and large parts of the world for, for, for a period of almost two years. And that, the, 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 the shock that that gave to the worldwide system really accelerated research into the development of these personalized uh, diagnostics medicine assemblies together with research in more general biomedical areas of course and so the ex that development was accelerated and so we got the reality of these home-based uh, assemblers as early as 2027 uh, in in their first in their first form and of course they are now absolutely routine and we all access them so that was an example where a, where a really severe worldwide perturbation actually in the end helped to focus the scientific community's mind on delivering a really complex solution on, on a very much accelerated timescale. The final example that I want to give you is, is the idea of delivering science fiction as fact. When I, when I, was, uh, when I was in your sort of uh, situation as a sort of, you know, beginning, beginning of my scientific research career, uh, the idea of going to, you know, planets other than our own and even returning to the moon were not we're not, and certainly, certainly the idea of, of, of going to another planet and actually putting long-term bases there was, was, was science fiction. But directed assembly has been a strong part of delivering science fiction like that as fact. And, and I would say that, you know, if you're looking at human exploration, this is arguably the most profound achievement that directed assembly has been able to deliver for us because it has been the driving force between making realistic the establishment of permanent occupied bases on Mars that, as you know, was achieved four years ago in 2057. It was an idea that had been advanced for a long time, but that some of the technical hurdles and, and actually some of the hurdles that we had in perceiving of the possibility were, were, were apparently insurmountable until the ideas of directed assembly uh, were, were able to be delivered. And particularly the autonomous directed assemblers that I talked about earlier on. So 
in the end, it became possible to visualize the establishment of permanent occupied bases on Mars only by this three-stage process. Stage one was verification missions. Stage two was the critical missing link. It was the autonomous construction that directed assembly made made available to us and then the consequent and subsequent environmental testing over many years without having to have people on Mars in that risky environment. And then that prepared the way for stage three, which is the human exploration area. And stage two was genuinely the missing link. And, 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 and I think that it was the breakthrough there that made all this worthwhile. And so now we can show pictures like this, showing what the bases look like. And uh, we can still see some sort of evidence of the sort of the sort of architectures that the early directed assembly, uh, you know, the, the autonomous directed assemblers were, were, were using. These are, of course, uh, you know, now large and much more optimized. But it was the idea of being able to put our materials building blocks into the, the environment and the assemblers being able to construct the right thing for the right environment and do all the testing of them in a completely autonomous way with no risk to human beings that made the, the make the big difference. So the contributions of directed assembly in the idea of Mars forming and making this a realistic were based around the fact that there was initial resistance to manned flights, not only the cost, but the risk uh, of, uh, you know, the risk to the, to the pioneers. We'd sent up a lot of unmanned robotic flights, but they had really reached their limit. There wasn't much more we could do. And, and there was a real issues with directing on surface activities. Uh, and this is important because uh, you might think, well, actually, you can just control things like assemblers remotely from Earth, so what's the problem? Well, of course, the problem is that you cannot do that because of the time lag, because of distances involved, for example. Uh, and, and also because of things like limited payload, right? So we, we, we had to be in a position where we could assemble on the, on the surface. And, and in fact, that might change once the space elevator is delivered, but we're still 20 years from doing that. Uh, and there was also an important need to respond to the evolving materials needs. And again, that really needs something which is responsive and autonomous to be on the surface, right? And we don't want it to be human beings. So it's got to be an autonomous assembler. Uh, and of course, the thing I alluded to at the start of this was the communications time lag, time lag. depending on, on where Mars and Earth are in their respective orbits, we could be in between six and 40 minutes communication time lag, which is no good for a system that has to be responsive, perhaps to rapidly changing environmental conditions, for example. Uh, and so the autonomous assemblers, to cut to the, to the to, to, to the main point, and I've alluded to this several times now, they were absolutely essential in delivering this. And of course, what they enabled us to do uh, were deliver breakthroughs, which was to deliver ultra thin and light materials of unprecedented strength and surface multifunctionality. Fine, that's what we want to do, but to deliver those on the surface of Mars, assembled on the surface, taking account of the local environment and the way in which it was varying. And that's the critical difference of needing the, aut the autonomous assemblers on the surface to do this. And so, you know, it was obvious that, and, and it's been delivered that we wanted to function, those to function simultaneously for structure, for, uh, for energy generation as heat exchangers and, and as environmental filters. And all of that was done in situ by the autonomous developers, you know, driven and advised from interventions back here on Earth. And so that really actually was, as, as you probably know, was, was one of the absolute drivers. It was the Mars shot, right? It enabled the materials assembler to be properly perfected you know, with a real goal sort of in mind. And so being able to, to do all that responsive manufacture in situ from basic food feedstocks in a remote hostile environment, and it delivers on the Star Trek dream and more, in fact. Uh, and just to, just to remind you of the history of that, of that, it, it, this idea enabled the unmanned pre-construction of these bespoke pods. Uh, and then we then had the first extended explorer landings in 2039, and people were able to go to Mars for a, for, for a month or several months. And then the whole base became human ready, as you know, about four years ago in 2057. And now we have the permanent, the permanent bases there, which, uh, which we're occupying on a, on a, on a long-term and hopefully ongoing basis. So that's really that, that, that was really it for some of the applications. I just want to to, to talk about WIDA itself and, uh, and 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 how it's delivered on the chal the challenge worldwide. And, and and that's WIDA. So the World Institute for Directed Assembly. And you can see in the background of this picture that word map that was generated from some of the important principles. Uh, and uh, I'll come to that. I'm going to just 
let you think about what WIDA might do to that word map, and we'll cover, we'll cover that in the next slide. But just to say, as you know, we founded this in, tw in 2027, or it was founded rather in 2027. That was 17 years after the Directed Assembly Network was launched in the UK. And it was funded through a major UN initiative, recognising the importance of the materials assembly and need to harness that worldwide. And actually that was looking towards seeing the benefits of that. And it embeds into disciplinarity as the norm. And it's, it's a more philosophical point. It's been part of the global dissolving of these artificial boundaries to science cooperation, which of course have been now manifest in other areas as well, which is great to see, including on the Mars mission. Uh, and just, just to say, I asked you to think about what WIDA might do with that word, that word array, and of course what WIDA would do, it would organize that. It would assemble that into something that looks a little more regular like that. So this is what WIDA does. It takes what's in the top right and it organizes it into what is in the main body of the picture. That's about it for me, folks. I just want to talk about the future just in the last, in the last slide here. So the success that we've had in directed assembly in its first 50 years really depended on the vision of the, of the pioneers, Wraith Bay, Makatsouris and others, and new ways of thinking about how we create materials, which were then adopted by others. Uh, the achievements are huge, hopefully I've illustrated that a little bit, but there are many more possibilities that we can explore in this area. So as attendees to, to this symposium, which is the, the, the first 50 year retros retrospective symposium on uh, directed assembly, we, we hope, the organisers hope, I hope, uh, that you're going to be inspired to start creating the next 50 years of this and go to it and tr remember you always need to get beyond the molecule. Thank you very much for listening to me this afternoon.